you know, problems. So we start our session with uh, Marcus Ferber from EPP. Yeah, vielen Dank, Frau. Yes, thank you very much, President. And I'm pleased to see that uh, you're feeling at home in Frankfurt. So you're even citing Goethe for me. So thank you very much for those very clear words. I have a couple of questions for you. You signalled that the ECB in the corona crisis has remained capable of acting. But at the ECB meeting in December, uh, people are expecting an increase in the PEP. Well, that raises the question again. Is the PEP fully legal? The European Court of Justice in its case law has dis confirmed that the existing purchase programs of the ECB are in line with European law, but that's because these are not selective uh, purchases, and the ECB has got thresholds per issuer and per issue, and that the purchases are based on the capital key, and all of this is limited in time. However, with the PEP, we've got maximum flexibility with regard to the maximum thresholds, and it's, you're suggesting that there's room for manoeuvre upwards. Is the PEP still in line with the case law of the ECJ? In October, the Target 2 payment system completely uh, seized up because of a computer failure. The consequences were limited, luckily because this happened just before a weekend, and the uh, uh, payments could be processed over the course of the weekend. But that does raise the question of IT security in the European Central Bank. You're in charge of uh, uh, banking supervision as well. And uh, in that area, you had a good look at IT security. And the European uh, Committee for System R Risks uh, raised a number of issues. What do you see as the lessons from the uh, Target 2 shutdown? How can it be possible that a single computer failure can uh, paralyze the EU payment system? Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much um, for, for your two questions. Uh, and it's, uh, yes, it's a pleasure being in Frankfurt, I, I have to say. Um, so on, on, on your first uh, question, um, I would first of all observe that the, uh, the decision that you're referring to uh, specifically excluded from its scope uh, any exceptional uh, programs that we were conducting at the time when this matter was under review. Uh, I, I remember vividly uh, reading those, those lines in the decision that was rendered. And if I may, I would um, suggest that the um, pandemic emergency purchase program uh, was indeed designed under exceptional circumstances uh, to deal with um, the result of the pandemic that was hitting our economies. And as a result of that, it is very specific uh, and it was intended to be, uh, to be targeted, to be temporary, to be exceptional, uh, which is really causing it to have a dual function. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, making sure that stability is returned to markets so that financing uh, can, be, can be made available. And second, it has a monetary stance function as well. And given the exceptional circumstances of uh, uh, the time, it was necessary to actually use a, a threefold flexibility, if I may say. Uh, flexibility in terms of assets that uh, we purchased purchased, which were different from the traditional purchase programs from the past. Um, flexibility in terms of, of uh, time. So we definitely had to front load uh, the purchases that we conducted. And flexibility across jurisdictions, uh, because in order to uh, restore that uh, financing stability and bring back stability on the, on, on the markets, uh, we had to do so. And those three dimensions of flexibility were indeed used uh, very early on as we, as we started rolling out the program. It's interesting to note, as we observe the sort of uh, bi-monthly uh, results of those purchases, that that flexibility, which was indispensable at the beginning, proved less indispensable as we were progressing and as the PEP was extremely successful 
on uh, particularly the first objective, as was demonstrated uh, by the narrowing of the spreads, by the yields of uh, the respective uh, bonds within the uh, European area, as well as the decline of spreads in the uh, in the corporate world as well. So I, I would submit that given the exceptional uh, purpose and exceptional circumstances, uh, those flexibility dimensions that were so necessary in the early days and less so as we speak now, uh, was a very, uh, very specific attribute of the program and, uh, and uh, much uh, needed uh, and fit for purpose, if I may say, in order to deliver on our mandate of price stability uh, within the euro area, as is mandated under the treaty. On your second point, uh, which um, refers to the payment system and the, uh, the, the, the incidents that we have faced with the payment infrastructure. Uh, we, I'm concerned about it because, uh, as you say, uh, efficient and uh, as, uh, as uh, rapid uh, payments and uh, uh, settling uh, between uh, the European institutions is, is a clear and very important function of the ECB. So we have decided to launch an independent review of this incident, the recent one, as well as previous ones, because we had uh, four in the course of the last 12 months. And because it affected the real-time gross settlement um, of um, system target two, particularly on uh, October 23rd, that is, that is not the last one of, of Monday, but the one before that, uh, we will conduct that uh, investigation uh, without any delay, without any, any complacency, because we need to get to the bottom of it. And we need to understand exactly what needs to be fixed, what caused uh, the, um, the outage, whether it had to do with power, whether it had to do with human error, whether it had to do with intrusion. I, I do not believe that the latter case uh, is actually what caused the problem, but we need to keep an open, an open mind as to exactly what caused it. And, and as, I get, as I said, uh, get to the bottom of it, fix them. And uh, clearly the euro system at large, because these matters were discussed at, uh, within the whole euro system, not just at the ECB. As you know, there are four national central banks that are very strongly linked in order to deliver on this um, uh, payment, uh, clearing and settlement, but the whole euro system is committed to identifying lessons learned from those recent incidents in full transparency and taking action accordingly in order to continue providing highly efficient and reliable financial market infrastructures to all the European agents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Jonas Fernandez from SMB. We can, yeah, hear can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, Madame Lagarde. I'm going to, to speak in Spanish. En, en las últimas de todo
Well, I wish I wish I could address your question, but unfortunately, the English translation was not available at all. Sorry, there was a problem with the uh, console. Is it working now? As you directly in English. Yeah, that's fine. Can you hear me? The speaker can repeat it in Spanish if you like. Okay, thank you so much. No, first question. Yeah, as you know, uh, some governments uh, in the European Council uh, has decided to block uh, the new budget, to block the next generation EU. Uh, and given that in your second part of, the, of your speech, uh, you uh, talk on the relationship between the monetary and the fiscal policy, uh, I would like to ask you directly about uh, these new uncertainties about the uh, implementation time of the new budget. And uh, the second question is uh, related uh, to the monetary policy, because as you know, uh, the inflation is uh, so far from the objective. Uh, I think that uh, with the current forecast, uh, at least uh, for a half of your mandate, uh, the ECB will not comply with its uh, primary uh, objective, with its primary mandate. Uh, and I hope that in the next few weeks, uh, new decisions uh, will have to be taken by the governing council. Uh, if you, if we want to, to, to solve uh, part of the uncertainty that uh, the European Council, uh, we are seeing that they are uh, creating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that you had to repeat your question, but, uh, and maybe we should have switched to the French translation. It could have worked. Um, but now I get it. Uh, concerning uh, the first part, which is not really a question addressed to me, but I would like to see, it gives me the opportunity to reiterate uh, that next generation EU and the RFF that forms a significant part of it are indeed uh, critically important uh, components of the response to the crisis and one that uh, is certainly provided on a pan-European basis, which has, uh, which has been um, an important component of the um, fiscal and monetary nexus, which had this European dimension to it, um, that was extreme, that was regarded as extremely positive. So, prompt implementation of uh, this um, next generation EU, including the RFF, um, in order to address the concerns that were first on your mind and on the mind of. Uh, council members and, and commission um, members in order to address the situation uh, hopefully will um, take place shortly. On, on your second point, um, when I look at what the uh, European Central Bank has done, um, which I have described in, in response to the previous questions, um, to, de to address from a monetary standpoint and with, its mi with in mind its mandate of price stability, uh, I think that the central bank has actually delivered. Uh, it has delivered by using two key tools, as you know. One is the PEP, which I have described earlier on. The other one is Teltro, uh, a new generation, Teltro 4, uh, which was clearly intended to encourage banks uh, to continue lending to the economy and as a result of that, and subject to subject to uh, that commitment and implementation of that commitment to benefit from uh, attractive uh, rates, I think we have uh, managed to restore some stability. Uh, we have managed to maintain financing conditions that were uh, supporting uh, the economic recovery, as we saw it bouncing in, in May and June. And we have also... Uh, delivered on, on our uh, price stability commitment. If I look at what is projected by staff, for instance, uh, what we have done so far and, uh, you know, measured from a uh, moment when decisions were made in March and uh, the end of 2022, it is no less than an additional 1.3% growth that we're putting on the table and 0.8% additional uh, inflation. So only by those um, yardsticks, I think that we, we have uh, delivered uh, as we were expected to. And that does not even compute uh, what it would have been had we not acted. 
because this is counterfact counterfactual and, and less obvious to demonstrate. But um, um, I understand from the studies that have been conducted by staff that those numbers are even higher than the ones that I've just mentioned. So I think that we have delivered. And as I said, we were here for the first wave and delivered. We are in the second wave and we will continue to deliver. There is no question in my mind. And that is the reason why during the last monetary policy meeting in October, I said very clearly representing the unanimous views of the Governing Council, that we would recalibrate our instruments in order to address the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Luis Garicano from Renew. Uh, thanks very much, Madame Tinagi. It's, uh, it's great to see you here, Madame Lagarde. Um, you know that uh, a few days ago, we at the European Parliament hosted an expert panel discussion to prepare for, for this hearing, for your hearing, for our dialogue. And it, um, Olivier Blanchard, uh, whom you know very well, having worked so close to him, spoke of the excessive risks the ECB's monetary policy is taking. Essentially, the problem is this. The pandemic emergency purchase program uh, was necessary when it was put in place. Uh, I congratulate you on it. It has indeed, as you said in your, in your statement, worked very well uh, at stabilizing the financial market. But the way it has taken excessive risks is in also targeting the spreads between the interest rates on the debt of the different countries. By using monetary tools and no fiscal tools, we have a policy that is all carrots and no sticks. Essentially, if a country misbehaves, we are out of tools to actually correct that uh, in, in, in any way. So, uh, in fact, even some countries are, like Italy and Spain, are refusing to use the fiscal tools, the fiscal space available in both the ESM and in the, uh, in the recovery facility, they're saying, oh, we, we are not going to take these loans uh, component of the facility. Obviously, they prefer money without a strings attached than money with the strings attached. So the alternative would have been, uh, and I, I, I think you might have preferred it initially, but it was, it, was a, it was a bad moment, I can realize that, would have been using the ESM with OMT um, the ESM with, uh, or, or with, the, with the traditional programs, as, as Mr. Blanchard uh, pointed out. The problem is that once countries are used to receiving unconditional help, it is going to be very difficult to move them to something with strings attached. Um, how do you see this question? Should we be using fiscal rather than monetary tools uh, with more conditions attached in order to close the spread between countries? Thanks very much. Thank you so much for your question and thank you for bringing back the good memory of uh, the days when uh, when Olivier uh, was working at the IMF and I was the managing director. I always benefited from his, his wisdom and his, uh, and his vision. Uh, but in a way, it was, um, and that's probably the, 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 the luxury of um, observing rather than being in the midst of, of things and uh, of looking um, in retrospect and uh, considering what would have been the best option had we had the luxury of choice. But frankly, um, we were and we are facing a global and common shock that has few precedents in recent history. And uh, when, we, when we put together the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme, there was no question that it was designed to counter the specific challenges of the pandemic supporting households and firms throughout the difficult times and restoring financial uh, finance, fi financing conditions that were supportive and restore some, some stability on the markets that were, if we all remember, very agitated. And, you know, while PEP shares the uh, market stabilization function with other ECB programs, such as, you know, OMT and, and others, the monetary policy heavy lifting that PEP helps carry out to ensure that the stance remains appropriate, even in the face of the disruptions caused by the new coronavirus shocks, uh, makes it a very different tool. You know, if I compare the, the two suggestions, uh, clearly the one uh, advocated by... Um, uh, by Olivier, which has, by the way, never been used, as, as you know well. Um, we were talking in those days of a completely different situation, where one country was facing particularly difficult situations. Remember back in March, all countries were facing difficult situations. It was this symmetric, exogenous shock that made no difference 
and hit all countries. So I think that, you know, there's no question in my mind that at the time, PEP, as we structured it, this emergency program that we put in place was the right monetary policy tool that we had to use at the time to, to deliver on the dual function that I have explained earlier on. So, um, you know, clearly, when, when fiscal and monetary work together, uh, as it did, uh, I think we, we provided the best possible response uh, to the exceptional circumstances. Now, clearly, as I've mentioned in my introductory remarks, uh, this monetary and fiscal has to continue hand in hand uh, as the pandemic is continuing to unfold without any vaccination rolled out and uh, will take us way into 2021. But it is also clearly the case that under the next generation EU, there are, uh, there are commitments and there are solidarities that have consideration. Uh, which hope, obviously uh, you will be attentive to, and I'm very pleased that the European Parliament take it, take, take it upon, take, took it upon itself to actually verify and see where money is spent, because it is vitally important that it is spent in the right areas with the highest possible multipliers and a real impact on productivity and growth going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Marco Zanni from ID. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Lagarde, for your contribution. Uh, your introduction. Mr. Zanni, we cannot hear you very well. Very good. Can you hear me now? Not very loud. I'm trying again. Can you hear me well? A bit better, but I don't think that it's enough for the interpreters, I'm, I'm afraid. Maybe you could take out the, the uh, earpods you have and, and, and use it without the earpods. Okay. I, I will try this way. Sir, I will re refresh your connection if you wait a few seconds. Sorry, C can you hear now me better? Loud and clear. Loud thank you. and clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and and, and sorry. So th thank you again, Madame Lagarde, for uh, your contribution. Uh, in, in your introduction, you mentioned the risk uh, and, and effects uh, associated to the COVID-19 crisis and, and for sure skyrocketing levels uh, of debt, both, both public and private, are one of the most uh, dangerous effects uh, uh, that we will have uh, to deal with in the, in the near future. Uh, in the past days, someone, including the president of the European Parliament, is starting to discuss about the possibility to cancel in the future part uh, of the debt purchased by the ECB uh, under its uh, uh, APP uh, program. We know that uh, there are limits uh, in, the, in the treaty, and I don't want to, to touch this point since uh, it's a political choice, it's a political discussion. Uh, I, I just would like to know technically what would be the impact of debt cancellation on the ECB and, and in particular if the related losses could harm ECB capacity in pursuing uh, its monetary policy goals. If ECB would risk uh, bankruptcy or if a central bank runs under different rules uh, compared to private banks or, or uh, other private uh, companies. And uh, uh, can, can you also explain uh, how and why the ECB, as, as stated several times by, by the bank itself, can work also with a negative equity? Uh, is the ECB in, in some way uh, a special institution? Thank you very much. So much for your question, and it gives me a, ch a chance to be extremely brief in my response. Uh, while I have read with I read with interest anything that uh, is uh, said, written, or interviewed by 
um, all members of European Parliament, particularly uh, their, their president indeed. And my response is very short because I don't even ask myself the question. It's as simple as that, because anything along those lines would simply be a violation of the treaty. Uh, the ECB operates under the treaty. There's an article one, two, three of the treaty which uh, prohibits uh, that kind of uh, approach. And uh, I respect the treaty, period. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to... Uh... Sorry, President, I have enough time for, for a follow-up, I think. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Zanni. You are right. You have time for a follow-up, please. Mr. Zani, please go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, t thank you very much, President. Uh, I know, as I said, that there are limits in the treaties, but it could happen in the future that uh, um, without a formal cancellation uh, of the debt, uh, the ECB could incur in, in losses related to uh, its holdings under the APP. So uh, I would like technically to know uh, what would happen if those losses uh, will uh, uh, erode uh, the, uh, the equity of the ECB and uh, how is it possible that the ECB uh, could run also with negative equity. Well, you know, as the sole issue of euro-denominated central bank uh, money, the euro system will always be able to generate additional liquidity as needed. So by definition, it will neither go bankrupt nor run out of money. And in addition to that, any financial losses, should they occur, will not impair our ability to seek and maintain price stability. Uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm afraid that it's yet again a, a fairly simple, straightforward uh, answer, but uh, that's, that's the reality that we are, we are dealing with. And I, I don't speculate uh, on, on alternative scenarios because we, are, we have a treaty, we are the only issuer, and uh, we are, we are not, uh, not at risk as a result. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I don't think there is uh, time for uh, other follow-ups. I think everything was uh, uh, clear. Now I give the floor to Sven Giegold from the Greens. Mr. Giegold, please go ahead. Sorry about the delay. Uh, I keep having problems with the connection. Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you and see you loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, Madame Lagarde, uh, President, uh, the ECB has, with its fast and bold reaction, played an outstanding role in stabilizing European economies during the euro crisis as well as during the pandemic. Expansionary monetary policy measures were warranted and adequate. I'm, however, concerned regarding the recent development of your targeted long-term long refinancing operations, short TLTRO programs. As a tool pro to promote bank lending, the TLTROs have provided beneficial borrowing conditions to banks that meet targets regarding their lending to households and firms since 2014. Yet, with the easing of conditions in spring this year, the current TLTRO 3 has become more of a broad subsidy scheme for euro area banks without effective conditionality. This has led to a record take up of TLTRO loans in June 
of 1.3 billion euros. Uh, so, however, the banks can now borrow money with even below the ECB's deposit rate. This means that even carry trades in which banks borrow TLTRO funds and deposit them in the deposit facility of the ECB can be profitable. Against this background, I would like to ask you the following questions. First, how many banks participating in the current TLTRO program do you expect to be eligible for borrowing at the minus 1% interest rate? Second, how do you ensure that TLTRO incentivizes the productive lending needed for the recovery from the pandemic rather than questionable carry trades, the build-up of unsustainable debt? And, and third, do you consider that the TLTRO programs have distorted the markets for banking bonds so that healthy and unhealthy banks pay very similar interest rates for their refinancing? Can market forces play still out the way how they should? Well, thank you very much for your, for your questions uh, directed to, uh, to our the second uh, key arm of our response to the crisis, the uh, uh, targeted longer-term uh, refinancing operations, which, as you've indicated, uh, has proven extremely uh, efficient. Let me, let me address uh, two points. <coughs> One is, uh, it is it's a refinancing program that was put in place with one clear purpose, which was to maintain, sustain, continue lending to the economy at large. Because clearly at the beginning of the crisis, we saw the risk of a, a, a freeze uh, of uh, the economy and a freeze of the financing extended uh, to companies. So that was, that was really the, uh, the purpose that we were, we were pursuing. As a, and as a result of that second point, we built that um, refinancing uh, program with a key conditionality, which is an imperative in order for banks to be eligible to the very favorable rate that you have mentioned. And that key conditionality is at least maintain the lending, of, the lending volume that you had uh, provided pre-COVID crisis. So the principle of the conditionality is that if the lending is not maintained, at least at the, at the pre-COVID le levels, and, and there are, there's a whole series of uh, complicated thresholds and measurements and reference periods that I'm sure you're familiar with that I will not go into because otherwise we'll, we'll exceed the time. But if they don't deliver on that conditionality, the favorable rate is not available and is, is returned to the DFR, which is 50, minus 50 basis points. So the risk of arbitrage, the risk of trade-offs that uh, you think of that, you know, we should be attentive is not taking place, I don't think is embedded in the system that we have built. And uh, I think the reason it has been so successful, because it has been, the take-up was, in, was in quite, uh, quite phenomenal uh, in June, had to do with two things. One is uh, the rate was attractive and banks felt that the conditionality would be satisfied and we all hope that it will be because otherwise the rate is not uh, available because they had a strong demand from firms. And in order to respond to that strong demand, they went out and uh, availed themselves of, of the TLTROs. But believe me, we are going to be extremely attentive, whether it's on the basis of the bank lending surveys whether it's on the basis of the feedback that we get from corporates, and, and we have our forum in order to actually uh, assess um, those, those points, or on the basis of data that we can collect. But we will be attentive that the TLTROs is actually, is, continues to be angled toward that purpose that we had, which was continued support to the economy. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Robert uh, Zill from ECR. Hey, yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Madame Lagarde, for your uh, very compre comprehensive description of macroeconomic situation and needs uh, to, 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 to do on both sides, and in particular also on the fiscal, expansion of fiscal policy sides, but you described it. 
very well. So, but uh, coming to the details, we know that yesterday Commission went with uh, data about uh, atom European sem semester, where you, where you can see the very different um, EU eurozone member states of EU are coming to very different uh, policy measures, including also s some of them are not using, in my view. Uh, some expansionary fiscal policy measures, and particularly with uh, with uh, this uh, well, uh, loan uh, credit guarantees and, and and some kind of other subsidies for the businesses, uh, particularly, uh, and uh, taking account also the different structures of economies in different eurozone countries, and also outlook, which is uh, when w w you, which was recently published uh, also f uh, in Financial Times and some other uh, papers. So that some of Eurozone member states can uh, expect that they will come to GDP growth uh, on pre-pandemic level or already on at the uh, year 2020, uh, end of 2022, but some will be far behind it. So, And this description I'm asking also, uh, taking account also that the ESM is not used, was, that was asked by my, my colleague uh, Luis Carizzano, uh, and also politically will be not used, and also RFF loans, I think, uh, majority cases will not be used. Taking everything in account, so I have uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, what do you think on uh, how we can, we, we can influence to, to borrow uh, money on the, whatever we use for the member states and to go with expansionary fiscal policy in the future? Would it be helpful if the um, Commission will come uh, in the nearest months is, uh, with uh, some how to say certain principles? How we can create? Uh, how we will come back not to the to to, uh, to the, the same level of the, of the growth and stability pact, which is a general uh, escape clause, uh, returning to the previous uh, criteria, but something which encourage countries to to understand that next two, three, four years where we can do. Uh, we, we cannot afraid of those rules. I think is it would be very important. And the second to the, your responsibilities to expansionary monetary policies, taking account all these differences in the eurozone, you you when you will have to increase in the future definitely. Uh, so interest rates so to 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 create a, a different environment when we are coming out of the crisis. Differences will be huge among eurozone member states, Do, and you have only limited part like PEP or, 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 or similar instruments which are different country by country. Perhaps you can, you can do some fine tuning, but uh, general interest rate, uh, well, well, it worked for all Eurozone. What do you think uh, it would be best solution for also your, for your part of responsibilities in this difficult environment? Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for your, for your, uh, your multifaceted question, in a way, and uh, and I will focus on, on on the present. I mean, it's it's uh, in a way difficult enough to uh, address the, the the multiple challenges that we're all facing at the moment, uh, let alone you know um, trying to project ourselves into uh, into a few years from now. So. In the present circumstances, uh, I agree with you that we are facing a fragmented situation. And it's fragmented also in the way in which um, uh, corporates uh, rely on or avail themselves of schemes that have been put in place. We are following that very carefully. Uh, this is certainly a concern here at the ECB. It's also a concern at the ESRB that we will be talking about later on this morning separately. Uh, but it's, it's obvious that in some countries, the guarantee schemes in particular that were made available have been extensively used. In other countries, much less so. And sometimes for reasons that we cannot really elicit very clearly. But there is discre discrepancies and there is fragmentation as a result of, of that. And while sometimes similar fiscal schemes were offered, they were not taken up with the, with the same, uh, same, uh, in the same fashion. So I would say... Number one, we are clearly monitoring. We are following this. Number two, we have a, a euro area mandate. And although we look into country-specific circumstances, we operate at the euro area level. And this is the mission that we were uh, endowed with. And number three, um, while clearly the monetary and fiscal nexus is important, as I have mentioned in my introductory remarks, and as I strongly believe myself from previous life, uh, countries in their reform efforts uh, should not spare uh, the opportunity to actually um, provide the foundation 
on which uh, the fiscal benefits of current policies and the monetary uh, stabilized stabilized induced financing circumstances they should not uh, lose that opportunity to transform their economies in sustainability direction in digital direction but also in improved productivity direction as well because that is how they will get um, a bigger bang for their for their for their euros and uh, the three should be aligned in the same direction in order to uh, prepare Europe to be a strong um, player on the geopolitical and geoeconomic scene. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor uh, to the next speaker. Just let me remind. Sorry, just rem a reminder to all my colleagues, please try to stay within the two minutes. Uh, I'm sorry, Dimitris Papadimoulis from GUE. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Lagarde, for the information you gave us, for the presentation. The recent assessments of the Commission forecast a big, very big increase of public debt for the whole of the Eurozone, more than 100% of GDP for my country, Greece, the debt is more than 200% of GDP. The Stability Pact has as a limit 60% of GDP. And the forecast says that for many years, perhaps decades even, we will have a deviation between reality and the rule. How do you see the point prevailing in the European Parliament that changes to a revision is required concerning this uh, stability pact in order to have a pact that is for stability and for sustainable development? That's the first question. The second question. We need strong monetary policy, but many say that we also need a strong and longer uh, financial po fiscal policy at a European level. Given the threats from some member states according to which they're going to delay or they're going to bl block the recovery fund, I would like to ask you, how do you estimate the proposals, the thoughts and studies that exist within the European Central Bank as well as studies? And they require this recovery fund to have a longer duration from the one decided by the Council, and perhaps some of its elements to become elements of a permanent uh, fiscal policy at the level of the European Union and the Eurozone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You raise uh, important questions. Um, and you are correct that the, the COVID-19 induced recession and the related sizable fiscal measures implemented by governments will imply significantly increased uh, government debt. Uh, you, I, I would not challenge your numbers. I'm sure you've checked them. And, and these debt overhangs will need to be addressed in due course to reduce risks to debt sustainability in the medium term. However, in view of heightened risks of a delayed recovery, a proper sequencing will actually be key, given that in the short term, continued support from national fiscal authorities and policies will be needed. Um, having said that, you know, it, it needs to be continued, and clearly the commitments that are made and that uh, we are uh, calculating on the basis of the budget submission lead us to believe that it will be in pretty much in the same ballpark as in 2020. But even if it has to be continued well into 2021, given what the pandemic is going to inflict upon our societies and our economies, risk to the medium term debt sustainability should not be lost out of sight uh, because we will return to some degree of normality. The economy will bounce back as it did in May and June and hopefully for the longer term. And that will impact, you know, numerator and denominator. So when we talk about debt to GDP, clearly debt has, clear, has increased. GDP will increase in due course as well. But debt sustainability has to be on, on, you know, on the mind of uh, policymakers. 
uh, and it will be important to take up again soon the discussions on the review of fiscal governance framework. It is something that clearly Commissioner Gentiloni has already uh, mentioned and addressed, and it will be for the Commission to come up with proposals and for Member States to agree upon the terms under which they operate, all of that within the parameters of the treaty, which, which have their constraints as well. Um, the, um, the next generation uh, EU um, instrument, as well as the RRF, were particularly welcome innovations on the part of the European institutions. And uh, my, my strong hope, looking at it from my perspective here at the ECB, is that it will be implemented and it will be rolled out uh, rapidly so that uh, the needs by many member states can be addressed, uh, as was agreed uh, by, the, um, by the Council and as was approved by your Parliament. Should that be a permanent instrument? Um, it is you know, not for me to decide and not for me to say. I would simply observe that it has been extremely uh, impactful and hopefully it will be very effective uh, when it is rolled out. And uh, you know, I, would, I would suggest that it could be interesting to explore whether that instrument or a similar instrument calling on the same principles uh, might be available should similar circumstances of an exceptional nature uh, arise again. But the mere fact that the Europeans could get together and produce uh, that exceptional uh, one-off uh, particular response uh, is in and of itself impressive. Thank you.